Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, we have three, three, not one, not two, three very special guests, uh, two returning guests who I think you know and love, and one new one who comes highly recommended. So the man with the beard, the alpha male, Ralph, Rafe Kelly, who's been on before, a creator of Evolve Move Play, Parker expert. He can probably jump off a bridge and then beat you up afterwards. Rafe is... Um, we like to think of him as the mover of the intellectual dark web, and we'll say what that is, or we could say the intellectual of the movement world. So um, Rafe is a friend of mine. He is super welcome. Nice to have you back. Rafe, please say hello. Hello. It's great to be back. That's what Rafe sounds like. Okay, next up, John Vavethi. So John is a professor at Toronto University. Did I get that right, John? Yes, University of Toronto. That's it. Um, he is famous for his lectures on YouTube on Western philosophy, the meaning crisis. He's an expert in bullshit and zombies. These are some of my favorite things in the world. I've been watching a lot of zombie movies because we're in the apocalypse right now, so I thought I'd get some tips. So uh, it's good to have the, the, the man here. So, John, welcome. Thank you, Mark. We also have Mike Nahan. So Mike is new to this, but he comes highly recommended by these other two chaps, a martial artist and a coach. So Mike, just because I I can't quite give such a a bullshitty kind of wrestling style intro to you, just because I don't know you so well, but you're so welcome, mate. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. Okay, so we're going to look at the pragmatic dark web. That's the uh, name here. So we should say what we mean by this, the dark web. Uh, Rafe, do you want to give us a sort of a brief overview of what that has been before we get to the pragmatic part? Yeah, so the dark web is a term coined by Eric Weinstein to describe a group of public intellectuals who um, were generally really... Uh, looked down on, I guess, by the mass media, right? There are, there are a lot of them who are highly controversial um, for whatever reason, but they were all really trying to engage in a, I would say, um, a positive sum conversation, right? And they were interested in this idea of dialogue. Uh, so that, you know, your buddy Dave Fuller from uh, Rebel Wisdom was one of the main channels that was putting this out. And then there's a second conversation that's kind of developed around John and uh, friends of his like Jordan Hall and um, uh, Peter Lindbergh and Daniel Shaw Machtenberger that's been referred to as the intellectual deep web. So it'd be interesting to, to dive into the distinction there. But I'll, I'll stop there and we'll let other people give uh, their feedback. Great. So there's some clever guys on the internet, intellectuals, some of them, some of them at universities, some of them a bit outside of that or very much outside that. Some of them sort of guests on the Joe Rogan podcast or, you know, Jordan Peterson's name was in there a lot. And, you know, some of them more conservative, some that wouldn't want to be seen that way, all a little bit rebellious, a bit outside the mainstream. And there was a time when it felt very restrictive what was in the mainstream. And it was very refreshing when a lot of these people started cropping up on my YouTube and people would sort of almost like slip them under the table. It reminded me of being a drug dealer. You know, they'd say, oh, there's this guy you should check out. And I'd get sent a link, but don't tell your liberal friends um, or whatever. And it was kind of exciting and cool. And then it's, you know, now got much bigger. And I guess that the main criticism I had of a lot of it was it was it was quite intellectual, quite wordy. There wasn't much on the body. There wasn't much on practice. And that's kind of my obsession. That's my life's work. And you guys too. And then someone said, oh, you should talk to John because he has this idea of um, ecologies of practice. And, pr- you know, John, you, you do Tai Chi and meditation, right, John? You're not just an academic. That's right. And how yeah. does that- what does practice bring to this whole field? Uh, uh, well, for me, um, I think one of the things that uh, the intellectual deep web uh, that Rafe mentioned is trying to get at is one of the central notions to put it in a bit of a slogan is there are kinds of truths that are only accessible through transformation. And this is kind of a thing that we've got to get our heads and bodies deeply around. We've, we've gotten into, you know, the sort of uh, model that we've in, uh, inherited from the Enlightenment, that all we have to do is sort of gather information, um, you know, justify our beliefs, and that's how we get truths. Um, and then there's an ancient idea that's being revived, and I think also renovated, to say, no, no, there's a lot of truths that are only accessible to us in transformation, and the only way you ultimately engage 
in transformation and ultimately aspiration is through, uh, through transformative practices. And these practices have to be comprehensively transformative uh, because the transformation that people are seeking and the truths that we're seeking need to be of a comprehensive nature. Uh, so for me, um, I, in fact, I often have the slogan, don't tell me what you believe, tell me what you practice, precisely because I'm interested in those people who are seeking the truths that are only accessible through transformation. Great. So an idea from John is this idea of ways of knowing. And this makes sense, right? Knowing about France is not the same as having been there and experientially got a sense of Frenchness, right? We understand that learning French is not the, you know, is a skill acquisition. So there's these different ways of knowing that this is quite, and this is why sometimes people look down on academics. They'll say, well, that's just academic knowing. Mm -hmm. And with this idea that it's been separated out somehow in Western culture to learning about things rather than other maybe deeper and more pragmatic ways of knowing and you know people that are into practices like we are like martial arts or meditation know this just as experientially yeah mike do you want to jam on that a little bit be nice to get to know your perspective a bit here yeah i mean i would say that um off of what john said you know part of participating in the in the practice of uh, movement or martial arts or, or any of the practices like yoga um you know, a lot of that is kind of a connection with your, with your body. And I think that right, right now in the age in which we live, we're kind of almost separated from our body a little bit. And these practices that reground you in, in kind of being and, and the experience of being and what it is to, you know, be mind and body together, um, that that's extremely valuable. And it's something that you can tell. I mean, a lot of people are looking for that. They're seeking that out. Um, and maybe it's a sense that something like that has been lost and needs to kind of be rediscovered. Yep, certainly embodiment is a buzzword that's trending. And uh, it's a good book with that title, by the way. And we've had over 50,000 people sign up for the embodiment conference already. I think we're on 52,000 because it's clearly something that people are hungry for they might not know the historical intellectual roots of that you know if you watch 50 hours of john's lectures you might find that out but on some instinctive level they're hungry for something a bit more visceral one thing i i think it's interesting that i wanted to point out here is the very idea of the intellectual right the frame of this is the the pragmatic uh, the pragmatic dark web or versus intellectual dark web um Nietzsche, who's a huge, huge influence on a lot of people in these circles, right? He famously described the intellectual, um, you know, as a shrunken, you know, completely malformed human being with a giant ear. Is that correct, John? I got that basically, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, uh, that's from The Spig Zarathustra, right? I think so. Uh, I think so. I'd have to go back and double check. Um, uh, yeah, I read, I've read Nietzsche uh quite comprehensively, but that was quite a while ago. So I, I'm, I'm not, I know how reconstructive memory works. So I'm a little bit cautious. <laughs> okay. So, so essentially, but here, here's, here's one of the giant influences in these circles. And, and this is what he's saying about, about intellectuals is that it's this tendency towards, towards, towards only getting the information and letting the rest of yourself die in a way, an atrophy. And, um, you know, uh, Peterson, who's a huge influence in this whole world, you know, doesn't like to be a think of himself as an intellectual either, right? He said that. Um, Nassim Taleb, who is someone who's very interesting to me right now, given the situation with COVID and, and how prescient he was about that and going back and reviewing his thoughts, he also, you know, uh, has a real problem with that. And I think that, that what we're seeing is that there is this distinction between embodied knowing and um, propositional knowing and then for certain types of people it can be very attractive to just accumulate as much propositional knowing as possible and the danger of that is you become that thing that Nietzsche was describing and thus spake of their sister yeah I think that's very important and um, I noticed uh, race gesture is very helpful there uh, the thing about uh, the having of propositions and, and it locks us into a particular mode the having mode um, and I think what Mike was pointing out to is re-embodying uh, re is one of the ways I think, I think it's maybe even the first way it's let's call it the gateway um, in which people uh, can return to the being mode in an important way. 
um, and access the the connectedness. I would I would suggest that it's not that we it, we shouldn't see think it just as embodiment. I think all four E's of the four E cognitive science are important, um, and, and I think Rafe, a lot of your your ecology of practices brings out them. It's not only that we're embodied. Uh, we're also embedded. You talk about, you know, being embedded in nature and getting that connectedness is really central. Uh, it's inactive, which, of course, is very central uh, to what we're all talking about, uh, that a lot of our cognition is done that way. And it's extended. We don't only have individual cognition. We have distributed cognition, which is part of what the web is, in fact, referring to, a distributed cognition. And so all of these things are ways in which people are recovering um, the ways in which we deeply connect, which are so central uh, to recovering the being mode itself. Nice. Uh, it's interesting, this idea of connecting and embeddedness. I've noticed on lockdown right now, I'm much more in place in my neighborhood and getting to know the people around me much more. Mm. Simultaneously in this kind of international online connection experiences like this, it's sort of, we're entered bringing this conversation like right into the modern world. I mean, we can go backwards and forwards. How are these practices, how is having what you call an ecology of practice, John, helping us right now? So um, right now, what, uh, I mean, I'm doing a lot of work with Christopher Master Pietro on this. I mean, there's ways in which um, we're experiencing a lot of the factors that were pervasive, but to some degree backgrounded in what I articulated as the meaning crisis. Uh, so for a lot of people, um, you know, they're, they're experiencing a kind of domicile. They're losing a lot of their home and it's really shrinking and they're getting a reciprocal narrowing of their world. And a lot of the things that kept them busy and distracted uh, have disappeared and they're sort of falling back onto, you know, our, our sort of ultimate resources of, 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 you know, meaning making and attempting to connect. And I think therefore what's happening is if you'll allow me uh, a bit of a turn of a phrase is the meaning crisis is coming home and people are finding that there's not much at home anymore. Uh, they don't have a lot of, although in some sense, our culture has made us all very egocentric and, and very subjective in our orientation. What, what does it mean for me? And et cetera, et cetera. We're realizing that when we all ultimately collapse to that place, there's not a lot of depth. There's not a lot of resiliency. There's not a lot there that from which we can give birth uh, to the new ways of connecting to ourselves, to each other in the world that are so central to meaning making. So meaning, meaning and life issues are very much at risk for people. And that, I think, gets confused with the actual biological risk, uh, and they reinforce each other a lot. So I think uh, giving people an ecology of practices that can help to afford that comprehensive transformation, not just transforming this or this or this aspect, but a, a total transformation, if, right? Um, is really, really crucially needed right now, urgently needed right now. I've started doing an, an online, uh, f you know, uh, meditation, free online live streaming uh, meditation course uh, for people. And the, the interest that, it's, that people are showing in that now compared to what I used to have is just, it's titanic in the difference. People are coming in. And what's interesting, Mark, is not just how how much they're appreciating the practice. They're also appreciating the way a community forms around a joint, you know, project, a, a practice of aspiring to be something other than we are and recovering. I just taught about recovering the being mode in a practice. And people are hungry for this now more than ever. Uh, for Like I said, because I think we have a lot of what kept us you know, Kierkegaard warns us about this. A lot, a lot of what kept us um, distracted from the existential concerns that are central to our humanity has been stripped away. And we're now facing, yep. I think, a stark challenge. Well, you just to, to, to define a few times, you talked about this meaning crisis, the idea of kind of Western civilization losing a strong sense of meaning, you know, the religion yes. isn't there in the yeah. same way, and yeah. just using entertainment to distract ourselves. Now, a lot of the entertainment's gone, yeah. and death's hand is kind of tapping us on the shoulder on a daily basis, whether that's, you know, real for many of us, or just imagine there's a sort of people are wearing masks, keeping away from each other. There's a sense of like death is in the air and yeah. meaning is back. Like I'm seeing a lot of people 
um, on the one hand, reorientate, like, what am I doing in my life? By orientating to meaning in a new way. And those that have resilience practices like the meditation, embodiment, you know, the interpersonal practices like the circling are massively better resourced. And those who don't have them are like, how do I get that? Like I'm teaching centering and meditation to doctors right now, even quite conservative doctors are like, okay, the shit's really hitting the fan. That looks useful right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's useful for a lot of different reasons too. I mean, you know, you, when you, when you talk about like reflecting on what's going on in your life and especially I feel like a lot of time is spent by a lot of people, at least that I know, looking at their habits, reflecting on their habits, looking at their relationships that are close to them and, and trying to see, you know, what's, what's going on here. How does our relationship actually work when we don't have all these external decisions to be making all the time? And I think that the, the ecology of practices that John's talking about, what that affords is kind of two things. It's more of like a homing against the horror of what's going on right now, but also almost like a, uh, psychophysiological calming, a grounding, like if you will, so that you can, you have more space and efficiency with which you can use to, to reflect on the things that are going on around you in your local family or community and the people that you meet or the habits that you have. So it kind of mixes these things of, um, being able to use this practice to help bring yourself back to a, a centered point from which you can, you know, operate better and reflect better or on what you're doing with your with your time with your habits with the with the relationships that you have i wanted to jump in and just um go back to something that john said at the beginning because i think it's uh it's a key point that could have gotten lost um and it's something that i think is a real grounding for the conversation which is this idea of domicide mm-hmm. um, i'm not sure that everyone in the audience will be familiar with that word but right homicide the killing of a man i uh, domicide the killing of home and this is something that I was deeply struck by in reading John's book, um, Zombies in Western Culture, um, yep. and uh, in you know in his lectures. And it seems to be something that we're experiencing broadly, right? Yes. But uh, this, in particular, this particular moment of the coronavirus, is a rapid shift in that, right? So I think there was a an ongoing sort of level of this existential feeling that we were ungrounded and that we didn't have a deep sense of home and connection to tradition, to community, to culture. It was all sort of stripped away, but all of a sudden we have a situation where um, not only is that kind of ongoing thing happening now, the way the world looks might be different forever or for a very long period of time today. And I think that one of the reasons you saw, see a lot of people who are still very skeptical of this, despite the evidence is a normalcy bias and a, essentially an attachment to that sense of the world as it is Uh Uh that allowing in the information about what's happening with coronavirus is essentially allowing the idea of their home of the world they inhabit to die. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that going deeper into an understanding what's going on there and why that, you know, is especially scary for us in this moment, because there's so much, there's so, there was so much death of home before we got to this mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is, a, is a really powerful place to start kind of developing insights into how we can approach pragmatically, um, getting people to get the resources that they need and be able to act, uh, act more effectively in the world. Great. I want to come back to this word pragmatic and underline a few things here. So, you know, we're doing theory and kind of two wings of a bird going backwards and forwards, theory, practices, theory, practices. So we talked about resilience practices, like, you know, personal ones, the centering, the grounding, the meditation, the martial arts, the interpersonal ones. So how do you build connection? And, you know, right now, a lot of people are relearning their intimate relationship, right? Or relearning parenting kind of, you know, on a sharp edge, I'm seeing quite a few, you might hear some of Rafe's young'uns in the background. And, um, or, and also in terms of community building, like suddenly building networks, both personally and, and on, on a bigger sense, like tribal sense that may have been, without idealizing that, more common in different eras. The nation state is coming back in a big way. I'm really seeing um, in Europe, there's a strong, uh, kind of fairly healthy on the whole nationalism in a, in, a, in a way that I haven't seen before. The NHS, for example, in the Britain, the National Health Service is a big deal. We started this uh, helpline for doctors and nurses and everyone assumed it was for the NHS and not international. I thought, okay, that's kind of weird, given most of my friends are super international. 
getting to know place. People have started growing food, you know, very practical things here. So, um, yeah, anything on those sort of very practical skills that may, that what John calls an ecology, meaning uh, a set of connected skills that each build different uh, aspects of self. John, is that a, a sort of fair? Yeah. The idea is that practices um, uh, um, have relative strengths and weaknesses. And, and what we want to do is we want to more, uh, mindfully and reflectively, hopefully also rationally, and with our best scientific information, uh, put together uh, these practices uh, with an eye to these respective sets of strength and weaknesses. So we form patterns of complementarity and patterns of self-correction so that, uh, again, we can service what you, what I call elsewhere the you know the ability for people to complexify uh, a system complexifies when it simultaneously is diversifying and integrating uh, you started out as a zygote and then you complexified you got different organs but they didn't just randomly right right you know differentiate they also self-organized it's in the word self-organized into various organs and now that you're a complex biological organism you can do many things while staying together as a unified agent and that's the thing that's crucial about this right the complexification that is attendant upon an ecology of practices is our best bet for how to deal with the complexity the dynamic complexity that people are now even more aware of if we were not even if we were aware of it before uh, COVID, we're now deeply aware of the complexity uh, of things and uh, building. So it's not just the individual practices. This is, I think, this is an important point that will get us what we want. And I am coming back to Rafe's point about rehoming. I think the ultimate way in which we can rehome with a kind of dynamic complexity is to be able to become ourselves a dynamic complexification that can stay in continuity of contact um, with uh, a changing environment. Uh, so we're basically trying to create an ecology of practices that help people that help people continually evolve with a continually evolving situation. And I think it, that's a sense of home, right, that goes back to things like Stoicism and Buddhism, where you try not to build your home around specific states or possession. You're trying to build your home specifically from your capacity to being in contact with the world and had to have an ongoing continuity of contact, a, a resilient connectedness, seeing home there rather than seeing home in like your set of objects, uh, sets of places, et cetera. And I think that's becoming more and more relevant uh, precisely because of both the crisis and the fact that in this virtual world, a lot of those old markers of home just aren't there anymore. They're just not there. Right. right. So in a world of rapid change, two master skills come into play. One is uh, non-attachment, the idea of like, hey, if you thought your home was there, bad luck, it's fucking gone now. Like if your status was built on this, now all of a sudden the guy who delivers vegetables is the new hero. Like right. maybe we'll come back to the heroic. You know, the, the whole status hierarchy's changed. The whole financial hierarchy's changed for a, for a lot of people. People's lives have been turned upside down, you know, in terms of where they get their identity from and the, the, all these pieces. And the second piece there is adaptability. Yes, uh, I'm seeing in people from the embodiment community respond really well, like fast, like yoga students of mine who just got their businesses online within five days. This ability to not just be in fight or flight, rabbit in the headlight, but actually be able to go, okay, what is happening? There's reality. Reality has changed. So I need that deep commitment to reality rather than uh, ideological kind of possession. Yes. Like commitment to reality. So then I can adapt quicker because I'm in contact with the thing that's changing rather than my fantasy of how it should be. Yes. I think that's well said. Yeah. Let's talk about the heroic. Oh, this is more there, more there, Rafe. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I wanted to, to direct this question to Mike, uh, because I think that there's something interesting here about domicide and specifically what's going on within the martial arts world. Right. Mm. Um, and also this connects to the idea of, of, <clears throat> of that complexity of practices, the ecology of practices. Right. So for me, as someone who practices martial arts and practices parkour and practices some of these other things, it hurts to not be able to go in and spar and kickbox and, and, and grapple, but I can still go outside yep. and, and, and jump around. But like, 
you know, um, and, and, and thinking again about the death of home, like some of the people who, who are the most resistant to this information about what was happening with coronavirus are, are, are people who are dedicated grapplers because yep. this is real. Then their whole, the, their central identity is disturbed for who knows how long. Mm-hmm. It's and, inconvenient truth and a half, isn't it? If your whole life and identity is built on close contact. Yeah. So you work in that world, Mike. And I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about my friends in that world. I'm thinking about my own opportunities to practice and saying like, yeah, what does this look like? You know, if this is a situation where coronavirus is contained, but it's still a threat and we have to wear masks and have our temperature sh- taken, it's like, yeah, you know, what's going to happen there? What is the sense that you're getting of this and, and, and how people can react well to that when they're central yeah. ideas around a body to body practice? Sure. Well, I mean, that's a great, that's a really great question. Um, as far as the, um, grappling element of it, um, in some sense, thankfully, I'm a little bit removed from that. My focus is primarily on the striking, um, elements of martial arts, but, I mean, it was one of the first things that I thought about was, was the people that were practicing grappling, wrestling, jujitsu, you know, judo, stuff like that, where you absolutely have to have hands on contact in order to be practicing like your essential skills. Um, so, uh, you know, that I, I think is, um, that a little bit remains to be seen, but what I think is reliable is that, you know, the martial arts, uh, the entirety of the martial arts, if you think of it as kind of like a spirit is so rich and so deep and there are so many levels that you can go to in order to express your practice and to better yourself through the practice even if you are removed from being able to do physical contact like this is a great time to reflect on where your skill sets were at the beginning of this you know global event um and to be able to kind of almost bring it back to the basics to your personal to your personal practice and then share that personal practice with others in the community via this this virtual realm that we have access to now but you know really, really you know specifically you go into the philosophy of the martial arts go and start with the thing that you know you know go into the philosophy of grappling go into the philosophy of judo go into the philosophy of um you know jujitsu Uh, Go into the philosophy of some of the striking martial arts. Go and read. I mean, there's so many layers to the practice of martial arts that it's almost like we forget that we have access to those layers because we get to go to the gym and because we get to practice with other individuals in things like sparring or drills or pad work or whatever. But there is an element of the martial arts spirit that is deeply like connected to the soul, so to speak. And that, that, that resonance can be gotten, you know, by going into some of the philosophies and by, by trying to discover things on your own in your practice. Imagine like you have to improve your physical practice without access to a teacher or a partner. What kind of things can you do, you know, and what, what kind of things can you come to understand about the roots of the system and and the ideas behind it? So I think that's a really, um, you know, for, for people that are practicing movement skills and and things, especially in the martial arts that, you know, you you have to go and do that because there's so much, there's so much value there. So I would really recommend that, that, um, you know, people explore that a lot. Yeah. For me, I, in a crisis, I would rather have one martial artist around me than, you know, 10 yogis, if I'm honest. And there's this something <laughs> about sort of someone that's done martial arts, which I can lean into them and I can see them leaning into that practice. And it, it's not just like even an intellectual, like looking at their books of the five rings or whatever. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a, something I've been really relying upon in the last few weeks is leaning into a kind of lineage of practice, which is almost a visceral you know, I imagine one of my main senseis, I can imagine his hand on my back almost, you know, it's a real visceral leaning into the, in a time of crisis is just an exquisite resourcing factor. Definitely. Definitely. It's all there. I mean, it is, it really is all there. And, and I think it's a time for creative exploration in your, in your art. You know, I really think that that's a, a huge component to this. And I think that doing that brings you into the flow state sharing that brings you into connection with community and that there's a lot to be gained from that. You know, if you'll, if you're willing to go and, and, you know, journey out there, right. That's part of the hero element too. 
Rafe, let's talk about place a little bit more. So a weird things happen. I'm, by the way, I was in like eight countries in February and one in March and one in April, right? So that my lifestyle's changed quite a lot from getting on a plane every week or two, you know, getting on a train every day to London or here or there to really being in one neighborhood. And I've started almost to map my name because I walk around it doing coaching calls with my students, you know, maybe four or five hours a day walking around. The government says I'm allowed one exercise per day, so I do five hours walking. And <laughs> so in the rules, and uh, I'm walking around and I've started to map that neighborhood almost as me. Like it's, it's like in the same way as a tool you use, like a sword or, you know, it starts to get mapped as you, it's not quite the same as like my favorite Aikido stick or whatever, but there's a way in which I, and I'm going down alleys I haven't been in before. And I'm looking at things with more detail. Like, is that where the food is? And I'm even looking at seagulls. Like I bet I could fucking eat you if I need a seagull. You know, there's a way in which I'm mapping my uh, literal ecology in a very different way now, which I know is someone that spends a lot of time in trees and getting to know the natural world. You know, other people just see tree. You see a lot more than that. So do you have anything to say on sort of how the, the physical environment when we're maybe traveling less is, is becomes more important? Yeah. It's an opportunity to embed, right? Like this is, uh, you know, the four E of cognitive science. Uh, when you asked me to speak at the embodiment conference last year, this is what we talked about was the idea of, okay, you're, you're, you, you can subjectively orient and regulate yourself in your body. That's embodiment, but you're, you're missing part of the self unless you have this deep embedding in the environment. Right? So I see these yogis and these people meditate and they're they're They can, if they if they can be in the right place, they can be so controlled, and yet they can be so blind. <laughs> right, they're not in community, and they're not in place. They're just it lost in their own flesh prison. Yeah. Um, Aaron Cantor described it as like getting trapped on the mat. The mat was a black hole that his self could go deeper and deeper into, and yet it was just it it was just getting stuck, you know. Um, and so, yeah, one of the things that I've taken up since I'm you know, I, I've actually been under tons of stress, but, uh, but I haven't been traveling. Um, but I've taken up the practice of sit spotting, which is something that comes out of the nature, uh, connection community, but it's one of the best ways to begin to develop awareness, right? It's a meditative practice that takes you into awareness of the natural world around you. So you sit in a place in nature and you observe Mostly the first thing you're supposed to tune into is the songs of the birds because birds tell you everything that's going on in the natural world around you. If you learn how to listen to them, because they will alert you and alarm you to a cat moving behind you or a fox moving behind you. Once you can tune in effectively to them. So you start to pay attention to that. And then, you know, when you sit quietly in nature for a long time, the nature starts to accept you and let you in. So birds that are afraid of you will suddenly not be afraid of you. A fox will walk past. The longer and calmer and more you sit in one place, the more that this opens up for you. So the practice that I've taken on is, uh, it's interesting, it's an ecology of, of a mix of stuff that I've learned from different people. So from Simon Thacker, I learned a concentration meditation. So I sit and I, I do the breath work, but I look at a specific point and I try to get my attention to fall completely into that point. And then I do the meta meditation uh, or I do a body scan and I do the meta meditation as it was taught to me by you, Mark. Um, and then once I'm fully presenced and sitting and I've been sitting there for a little while, then I drift my attention out and become very aware of the place. And then you can take that awareness and you can walk, right? And all of a sudden you start to notice that there are hummingbirds everywhere in their specific places. And they have little territories that are to defend that are quite small. And you can, you can walk through them and see where the hummingbirds' territories are. Um, and so you, there's this, and I think that, that this is the information that we were tuned into that gave us a sense of deep competence and a sense of, of, of being capable throughout our evolution, right? Like being able to code, being able to read, those are modern iterations of being able to track and read the landscape. Right. Uh, right. And when we miss that, we've missed something deep in our connection. So that's, that's probably enough for me, but um, go on with beautiful, you guys. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. I started noticing I lived three floors up. I somehow wasn't aware that I'm living in a, 
in an apartment, a flat three floors up. And I'm now I'm like, I'm in the sky right now. <laughs> and this, I, I kind of, I met my neighbors. So I got, I know that there's John up there and Jack, you know, Sarah there, you know, it's a very different feeling than a month ago. Absolutely. What's interesting is the work that's coming out. Uh, uh, Barbara Tversky has mind in motion about uh, the, the, that kind of tracking and navigation uh, the literal tracking and nav- navigation of the invis- uh, the the, uh, the physical environment in that deeply coupled way that Rafe was describing so eloquently. Um, how much that is at the basis of um, how we navigate in our thoughts, how we navigate in our thinking, how we navigate in our problem solving, how we appropriately connect, um, you know, our different skills. So basically, that machinery that we had previously. Uh, so backgrounded, and then as you pointed out, Mark, we're now a- waking up to, we're being sensitized to. Um, I hope what, what can come out of this is the the deep recognition, recognition of that, that, that how that navigational relationship to the world is so fundamental. It's primordial uh, to a lot of our other uh, what seem like abstract abilities, our, our cognitive abilities and the way we're in our heads, as people say. Um, and so for me, that that's an interesting place where all of the four E's come together uh, because navigation, physical navigation requires embodiment. As Rafe just indicated, it's really about, uh, you know, embeddedness. Of course, navigating is also an action. You know, you're, you're, you're having to constantly adapt the sensory motor loop as you move around the environment. Um, and there's an important way, as Rafe just said, it's extended. He was making use of the cognitive machinery of the birds, right, uh, in order to do what he was doing. And, and all of that and how we are deeply attuned to that. And we think we ha- there's a sense, I, I take Rafe's point to be correct, in which we, in sense, one sense, we've left it behind. Um, but there's another sense in which we can never leave it behind. It's primordial. And the degree to which that primordial level is starved is the degree to which we lack it, it it can't permeate up through the rest of our cognition what it does is we, if we starve that lower level if you'll allow me to me- that metaphor right our, our 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 depth and resiliency is also deeply deeply starved it looks like the most you know why you know walk around a tun- wow 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 you know that sounds like just a trivial thing to doing i'm trying to actually make an argument here no no it is really really important um, if you want to develop the capacity uh, for, you know, adaptive resiliency, then uh, waking up to uh, that, that what, what you might want to call the navigational aspect of our being, I think is really, really central. I think it's, it's really important. Mm. I'm, I'm kind of feeling and kind of going, like, what's the thing that's really emergent here between us four like what's the thing that's like most live most juicy for us to um quadra inseminate each other and uh <laughs> what would be the love child Rather apt. of this weird beardy mansum for some thing that wants to come out of this so we've uh, there's something about like it's pragmatic but then there's this intellectual tradition I, I keep finding myself drawn to the heroic again. This is heroic quality at the moment, you know, in terms of crisis. Like, John, your work on zombies is the zombie, as I read it, and I, I always had this intuition loving zombie films that there's this idea that the sort of modern man is half asleep, you know, neither mm-hmm. alive nor dead. And there's something very, on the one hand, we're in this very liminal time. Like, people don't know what's happening or how it's going to turn out. There's a real liminal, not knowing, emergent something to the, the present moment that some people I've, I've been experiencing as um, quite mystical, like the betwixt and between, the dawn, the dusk kind of moment. We're in that dawn or dusk time. Other people just want to sort of block out and stay busy and ignore, you know, or, or try and get some sense of competency by cleaning their house or, you know, some kind of uh, displacement activity. But then there is this opportunity in this not quite it's not quite one thing or another and yet it's very alive i think yeah. it's most, we, i don't feel like a zombie now there's a way in which people in society seem like human beings again well i think that's very important i mean 
I mean, the word crisis actually means judgment. That's what the Greek word means. Um, and so this is a time where we are rediscovering that we have to exercise judgment, where that doesn't just mean propositional judgment. It means like reevaluating, reconceiving, getting insightful understanding into the things that ground us. And I think this, this theme of awakening is really uh, one of the things that is uh, emerging between the four of us. Uh, and I think uh, another good uh, word that comes from Greek is kairos, that we're at a kairos, we're at a turning point, where very many things have come together to afford something analogous to what happens to an individual and an insight, but it happened collectively. Things that would seemed impossible to consider or non-viable fictions are now, now people are, are, have recognized them, are judging them now to be real possibilities, real options, and, and that's important. Um, and, that, and I think what's happening is uh, we have to facilitate pe improving people's judgment as they try to reappropriate those real possibilities that have now come alive for them. And the thing you do is to pay attention to development. When we are in liminal, when we are in between stages, when we are moving from one way of being in the world to another stage, like in child development, what, what the main machinery that facilitates people getting through that reconfiguration of their ability to judge and make sense is serious play. That's what kids do. They engage in serious play. And I think what we're trying, I think between us, what we're trying to do is get people to remember deeply remember serious play and why it's serious and that our culture is really messed up about play. Uh, we either trivialize it into entertainment or we think of it as some lascivious way of gratifying our own egocentric needs, right? We, but what's, what we forgot is that the primary evolutionary function of play is to give us what we need to develop our ability for judgment um, when we are in Kairos, when there is a turn turning point in our fundamental competence. And I think all three of those are what is most alive for me right now. You know, crisis, Kairos, and serious play. Yeah. Yeah, I really, I really like that. Go ahead, Rafe. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> about play. And I think it also connects to the heroic archetype and, and, and how we become the type of people who are not atrophied intellectuals with just ears. Um, so my children are out of school, right? I have three small children, a seven-year-old daughter, a five-year-old son, and a, and a two-year-old daughter. Um, and we have a, a couple across the street who have a, a, a um, seven-year-old and a four-year-old. And our kids are not allowed to socialize with any other kids right now. But because those, that family, we've had an open-door policy with since the kids were tiny, right? They just The kids run back and forth and play. So they actually have a cabin up in the woods. They came back um, from the cabin to, and they, you know, the kids were just so excited about having the opportunity to play with each other. So they were playing and then we took them out to the woods and they got to play and climb trees together. Towards the end of the day, um, they, just, they decided they wanted to climb onto our roof and they'd never been able to climb onto the roof of our main house. And, you know, and I was like, well, okay, I'll spot you. <laughs> right. Um, and so Trey, the older boy, who's uh, he's seven, he climbed up and then uh, my daughter, Audrey, and then Scarlet, the girl next door, she climbed up to the, to the top of the roof. She's four. Um, and then Kier, my five-year-old, he's very strong. He can do seven pull-ups. He can do front flips on the trampoline. He can jump really far. But he started to climb up and Scarlet took the chair that he was using to climb up to, to climb something else while he was in the act of climbing up. And he, he got a little scared and reached down for the chair and he flipped out because it wasn't there. So he had that huge burst of fear. Um, so, you know, but he, he wanted to be with the, uh, the other kids. He wanted to do this, but he was having this really intense fear experience. And so I told him, you know, it's like, it's okay. Like, take your time. I know that you can do this, you know, just, just, just wait till you're ready. And so he came back and he almost backed out and he, he went through this several times. Um, but finally he gets up on the roof and then he's so excited and he's jumping and he's playing. And then it came time to get down off the roof and the getting down is really scary, right? You have to sit on the edge and turn and that act of sitting on the edge and turning and trusting yourself to reach down with you, where you can't see with your feet was really scary for him. Uh, you know, so I sat there with him and, and made him sit and just like asked him, what does it feel like to be afraid in your body? 
right? What is it, what does it feel like in your belly? What does it feel like around your heart? Like, what is your heart doing? What is your breathing doing? And just had him calm down. And, you know, he got down and he, and he did this and, and then he, he got to the other side and now he's asked me to, to spot him now multiple times doing this. So people think when kids are playing that it's just this, it's just the giggling and the jumping, you know, and the, and the laughing, but he was, he was having intense emotional pain because of what he chose to do. He was absolutely terrified and he was feeling um, separated from the group, right? He was, he was like an outcast because everyone else is up on the roof and he's not able to be with them. It, that's, that's incredibly serious, right? Uh, and so having, the, having the resources to overcome that is precisely the type of thing that we're trying to develop in ourselves so that we're the type of people who, when the world changes, can confront it heroically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really, I really. I like that. I like that, Rafe. Um, you know, I have a, I have a 19 month old boy myself, so I, I'm sure I'll have a lot of those experiences uh, to come, but I wanted to jump on something, um, you know, that Mark and John were saying about the, you know, the Kairos and the hero. And I know John, you know, about the hero, we won't, we don't want to, um, um, put that thing on, on too high of a, a pedestal, so to, so to speak. But I do, I do think it's relevant at this, at this moment in time, um, you know, it seems that the Kairos is almost like that's, that's the place where the hero takes action. Um, I, I think that, you know, that, that opportunity to seize the moment and in order to do that in a heroic fashion means you have to be doing things that are difficult. So right now, you know, um, Mark, you said, you know, you're, you're feeling almost more human, you know, you're having, I'm having loving it. human. I'm loving it. Yeah. Loads it's actually really interesting, to, right? Step yeah. up and do heroic shit right now. And right. My, my right. personality's back in fashion. So I'm having a good time. <laughs> well, the, the interesting thing too, is that anything, any direction that you're going to go from here, uh, is in the direction of the unknown, really. Like, unless you're going to sit back and, you know, hope that things, you know, just return to normal. Um, so, so we're all in a sense activated from this survival perspective. Um, you know, our, our, our physiology is activated, but then also, you know, we have the opportunity to, to look ahead and see what needs to be done in order to go to a new and better place. And that, that those decisions, those moments of judgment and action, that's the Kairos. Like that's the moment that you actually need to be heroic and, and be like, Oh, I'm going to go for that. Or I'm going to make this change. I'm going to endeavor to do something, you know, that's going to have a, a positive transformative element to it. Um, so I think that those are, those are all really connected. And I think we're all kind of in the bearded way <laughs> going through that right now. A lot of beards here. I did you know, I noticed maybe we could get to talk about masculinity as well. I, just before the <laughs> podcast, I said, Oh, I remember this in my diary. Aggie set it up. Who's there? And I went through the names and I was like, okay, penisy name, penisy name, penis. Oh my God. Oh my God. It's all men. Am I going to get in trouble for this? Like there was this moment of fear of like having an all male panel. I mean, I haven't checked, so I don't know Mike, you know, but it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, ge- I'm just guessing. I'm just guessing. So, I, I wonder like what masculinity looks like in this environment. John, any thoughts on that? Well, I want to, I, maybe I can bridge to it. Um, yeah. Uh, because I think there was something in what Mike said, and uh, and there was also, I I, uh, I don't know if Rafe's uploaded it yet, but Rafe and I had a really important, I think a really central, and I I'm, I want to get it out there conversation about the hero archetype, and uh, uh, I think it was a very valuable discussion. But one of the things I want to say, maybe to tighten up the connection between uh, the hero um, and, and the Kairos that Mike was alluding to, is we have to remember that Kairos means like we're, we're it's like we're in criticality in a system. It can bifurcate. It can go multiple ways. And, you know, uh, one of the things that I think the, the, the hero has to do, I mean, the virtues are not separable uh, from wisdom. I, 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 I take that Socratic thesis very, very seriously. And, and, and heroism and courage are not separable from uh, wisdom. Because I think part of what courage means in this situation is seeing through um, the, the illusions and also judging and choosing which one of the things that's trying to come to life, which one we're going to try and, you know, bring to birth. 
to use a feminine symbol perhaps right now. Uh, but the, what I mean is there's a lot, and I've talked about this in other places, there's a lot of things that are happening. Um, there's, a, of course, uh, we're going to see tremendous uh, nostalgia, and Mike alluded to that. One of the things that's going to come out of this is people, let's get back to normal. And Rafe alluded to that. Like, come on, let's get back to normal as fast as we can. And there's going to be, we have to, you know, well, part of the heroism is because we, can we, can we navigate away uh, from the nostalgia? There's going to be people offering us uh, the certainty, the certainty in quotation marks of their utopic vision. And this all we have to do now is X, Y, Z in my particular, you know, uh, a, a program of realizing the, you know, inevitable bright future. I think that's very dangerous. I think we are seeing a rise of people um, engaging in a various dangerous kinds of thinking. The virus, in many ways, has the features of an Old Testament deity. Yes, flood, yes. flood narratives. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. flood narratives, judgment narratives, yep. right? And that's, of course, the, one of the original connections between crisis and judgment. Um, and the idea that, you know, because the, the, it's out there, it's ubiquitous, it can strike at any time. And look at what we're literally adopting. We're literally adopting purity codes. We're literally yeah, yeah. adopting purity codes. So there's a danger for conspiracy thinking, all this, kinds of, uh, all this kind of stuff. All of this stuff is floating around. There's a lot of ways of being that are in competition how it, here. It's not, and this is, this is a deep point from Socrates. It's never just a competition of arguments. It's always more fundamentally a competition between ways of living, ways of being. And there's a lot in a kairos that are all mutually salient, and they're all competing. Competing. And part of the heroism is to help people to navigate through that so that we can go forward in a way that is ultimately wise. Stay in the not knowing listeners, like stay in the new. There's a way in which I see people at first, they were just fight or flight. And now everyone's doubling down. You know, there's uh, the kind of uh, my ecologist friends, a lot of them, who, you know, obviously make very good points often, but they're, you know, the, it's almost like this religious quality, like man has sinned and now God will be punishing him with the virus. You know, it's just kind of like a preacher, but, but dressed as Greta Thunberg, right? It's, it's this, this, oh, and the conservatives are saying, well, you know, the sinful ways of man, what did we expect? There's this sort of sin and punishment. And it's like, it, it feels cheap. It feels plastic. It feels old. It feels like a, a doubling down on some tired shit rather than actually, whether it's conservative or liberal or ecologist or whatever, rather than staying with the fact you actually don't fucking know right now. You don't know. And we need to be deeply listening and deeply responsive and, and meaning making as best we can, rather than just falling back to what we already know and doubling down on it. I know it's just compassion in my voice around this. It's, yeah. it's something pissing me off that you've helped me articulate there, John. So thank you. Um, well, the meaning Jordan Peterson's book, there's a chapter called uh, The Strange, The Stranger, and The Revolutionary Hero. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that anomaly is threatening, right? It's also promising, but it's threatening. So when, when something new happens, it can be a virus, right? It can be, you know, so a strange uh, uh, people showing up <laughs> um, and, you know, having wearing different clothes that 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 indicates an anomaly and our basic structure for anomaly is all these things. But one of the things that is an anomaly is the hero, mm -hmm. right? Someone a hero is the person who sees uh, the problem before everyone else sees it or sees a new way of being before everyone else sees it. He talks about shamanic transformations as places where you go out and change yourself such that you can see that. But that makes you an outcast. And, and right and, now, you can, just being a little ahead of the curve is massively powerful from a leadership point of view. And the whole community is like, wow, you're amazing. You thought of something two days before we will. There's this, 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 this sort of huge heroic possibility of just being a little ahead of the curve. Listen, because people are going to see the video, I want to acknowledge that Guy Senstock has just dropped in, dropped in for tea to the, to the intellectual pragmatic man party. Guy Senstock, founder of Circling. Can I just say a quick welcome before we let Ray finish off his point there? Ray, Guy, welcome. Thank you. I'm my apology. I overslept this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Shit happens. I'm cutting everyone extra slack because it's the end of the world. Ray. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So... 
there's a, you know, Mark, there, there's an aspect of the heroic individual, which is this assertive masculine energy. And when things are stable, when things are safe, or at least we think they're safe, um, that's a very disturbing energy. That's a scary and anomalous energy, right? The revolutionary hero, you don't need a revolutionary hero when everything's great. But when right. I, I also get the sense sometimes people feel like I'm dangerous, but now I look in comparison with the world, I now seem safer, <laughs> which I'm really enjoying. I'm like, oh, man, a heroic protective mancock, no longer scary. You know, this is this for me is an incredibly relaxing time in that way. But uh, we're just talking about masculinity guy in the face of crisis and meaning making. And, you know, I won't try and bring you up to speed, but you're welcome to jump in. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's, it's just an interesting thing. So to, to wrap that back to what John was talking about there's going to be a desire to return to normalcy mm -hmm. and normalcy is the state which exposed us to this risk in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's a profoundly dangerous tendency. And so as we confront this crisis, we do not only need to confront the crisis to get rid of it. We need to look at this crisis as the opportunity to come out as a more virtuous, more organized, better integrated, more compassionate, and understanding society, right? That's the, the job of the heroic individual in this particular moment, and really all, all moments. But these moments are the moments that, that give rise to that potential, right? The revolutionary hero is, is more welcome when there's a revolution already happening. But, you know, this is this point that Taleb has been making over and over again. We have a crisis, and we double down on the very things that made us vulnerable to that crisis. Mm -hmm. You so how do we create a more anti-fragile world? Yeah. Oh. Sorry if I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that I, I was pretty much um, I, that was that was that was the sum of my thoughts. So I, I really love to hear feedback on this. It's Irish rules, anyway, not Canadian. People are not to interrupt. <laughs> okay. Well, anyways, I I, uh, I think that was very well said. Um, I mean, you know, uh, and Rafe and I were talking about, you know. Part of what this may mean is kind of a meta thing. Um, uh, I have to say meta at least once because you know, I have philosophical training. Uh, <laughs> which is not only the need for the hero, but maybe a reconfiguration, reconceptualization of the archetype. I mean, it, it's a, a point of, that Jung made is... Um, you know, the symbol, we never have the archetypes. We, we only have a symbolic coupling to them. And the symbols, the symbolic expression of the archetype has to continually be renewed. I mean, that was part of his critique of Christianity. It had symbols that worked for a very long time. And then, like everything that has a life, uh, the symbols can die. And Rafe and I were talking about getting clearer in our culture about the hero. Uh, Rafe made a very excellent point how I had been, in some of my critiques, and Mike was alluding to that, I had been conflating the hero with one version, which is the warrior. And that's, uh, 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 and that's something that our culture does very readily. Um, so, I mean, I made a mistake, but I'm saying it's a, it's a reflective mistake. It, in that sense, it's a, it's a good mistake. It's a helpful mistake to become aware of. Uh, Rafe was pointing about, you know, um, the, a sense of the hero that encompasses um, the sage, which I think is something that he's alluding to here. Uh, famously, Socrates was a tip -off. He didn't belong to any category, and he exemplified a way of dialoguing and a way of being uh, that didn't belong to any category. And, and just to make sure that everybody's clear on how pertinent this is, Socrates was doing his work while Athens was under siege and had suffered a major plague, right? So his, his work is even more relevant to us now uh, than it might have been when I was talking about it even a year ago. Uh, this is what I mean about a Kairos, how it makes things viable and possible that even five or six months ago, people could have been dismissive about. Who cares about Socrates? Well, I, maybe you do now, because he's in a circumstance remarkably similar to your own, and he is portending a way of staying on the edge of emergence that integrates, you know, more... I don't know, traditional notions of the hero with more traditional notions of the sage. And I think that's really, really uh, important. And I, I, I want to hear a little bit uh, from everybody, but I want to hear a little bit uh, from Ray on, Ray, Rafe on that because, you know, part of what I took away from our discussion was that we, we shouldn't just valorize uh, the hero uh, archetype. We, we have to re-symbolize it in an important way. Part of what's going on right now is, in fact, I think that. 
What do you think about that? Just to briefly, yeah. the doctor as hero is the new one, right? Yeah. It's not the warrior, it's the doctor or the nurse. That's, that's it's Actually, it's not that new. Read Camus' The Plague. The hero in The Plague is the doctor. And the doctor refuses nostalgia and refuses utopianism. He refuses both. He tries mm. to stay in contact with the absurdity, in Camus' sense of it, of the situation. As you said, Mark, he refuses any false or pretended closure on the radical uncertainty. And I recommend that novel. Yeah. Uncertainty is a, oh man, so many things that I want to call off on here. <laughs> uh, after I have to read that. Um, so I, I wish that I had, had, had published our, our interview now and that all of you guys could have, could have, could have read it so we could have gr- or listen to it. So we could have grounded it there because I think it'd be, it, it's a really useful dialogue, but we have this dialogue where um, about the nature of the heroic archetype. Um, and so we'll, we'll make sure that goes out and people can see that. But um, the, one of the, the points that, you know, that, that John's bringing up is the idea that we as a culture have made our heroic archetypes very warrior oriented. But if we think of the hero as the person who proactively confronts what is the the problems that we face, whatever they are, then the warrior is only one facet of how we do that. And we're talking about masculinity, um, but you know, one of the most beautiful moments of the the reconceptualization of the hero that I've seen right now is a video of a paramedic, a woman who's walking outside of her apartment, and her entire block is clapping for her as she goes to work. Right. This is a, a moment of the recognition of the heroic. The doctor is hero. And um, so I think it, it's interesting because I think there's a there's an interesting break down of a lot of the the cultural narratives that we had. Like this is shifting everything. Like who who what are the like it's felt to me like the old left and right breakdown in our society has been breaking for a while, mm-hmm. right? But this is breaking it again. It's like, like I'm looking at who are the people who are just completely out to lunch on this, right? Like the people who are like still denying it. And it's like, it's not on the right and it's not on the left. It's elements of both. Something right? else isn't there emerging. Yeah. 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 It's the, it's the crazy wooey anti-vaxxer hippies and the anti-vaxxer conservative Christians and the, you know, and, and, and martial artists who've never sparred and like to tell fantasy stories and conspiracy theorists, like all these people, are, I call them the, the, uh, the coalition of the epistemologically misguided. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can better than misguided. I think there's a more insulting, colorful word that might might be used there. But uh, yeah, Ep- but, philosoph- ep- ep- say that you're philosoph- epistemologically epileptic. How about epistemologically uh, misguided? Epileptic. Yeah. It works better. It's alliteration. Trust me, I sell shit. Guy, and then Mike. Guy, what are you just randomly walking into this? <laughs> Mad cafe of insane philosopher kings. What 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 are you taking away? What are you bringing in? Well, I'm I'm I think I'm experiencing it. I, I'm just sitting. I'm listening to everybody talk, and I'm just I'm having this experience of masculine love. <laughs> it's like I, I think about and my friend Mark talks about this. He's like feminine love is kind of like I already always love you, and masculine love is I fucking love you for that. I love you for and. Uh, just the sense that there's, there's all of us have gotten together to zero in and penetrate into a deeper level of reality for the greatest good is just yeah. a, a can, there's something about that that feels very, um, very masculine to me. Like, what is it? What is it? And it's, we're wanting to know both because there's like a love of truth in, a, in our different ways. And also because it's for the common good, right? There's a commons that really needs serving right now. Like I believe that you know passionately, and it's like the mind and the heart. It's just going. What what what's going on? What's going on? Because if we can be there a little bit ahead of the saber toothed tiger, we live. Mm-hmm. Everyone lives, mm-hmm. right? If we go, oh, that's what's rustling in the bushes. <laughs> right, right. Like, well, I think you. I think you've touched on something. Uh, you know, as far as the pragmatic. You know, that's one of the things that we started off with the conversation. Um, and you know, if we're talking about the the kind of masculine role or, or the direction right now and the hero archetype, it's like, well, you know, whether it manifests as, uh, the warrior or the doctor or the sage, or, you know, or the artist that is going to be, that's, that's kind of like the unique quality of the, 
the the archetype is that it's going to manifest in different ways in different people. So I think something that's really that you can take from this that is pragmatic is, you know, examine yourself and and your roles and where you might be capable of going and be honest about it. And then, you know, step into that. How is it going to manifest for you in your life, in your circumstances, in your circumstances, you know, now based on what you have built and, and come to understand pre this global, uh, you know, event, um, and, and where you might want to be going because you, you can't, you know, you you can model, you can emulate, you can explore different manifestations of the, of the, of the archetype, but ultimately there's going to be something that you know, that you sense that stands out or is salient to you or is relevant to you that you can kind of embark on and embrace. And that, that, that's kind of like, this is the ultimate call to adventure for the hero. This circumstance that we're in right now is the ultimate call to adventure. If you're willing to, you know, step into that, that role and try to do something. Um, and I think that not necessarily to concern yourself too much with, you know, which are, which manifestation is most appropriate right now. I think like, look, look more to, to the local, to, to the individual level, you know, how is it going to come about for you? How's it going to emerge for you? Um, and then, and I think that, you know, you couple that with the other elements of the generative, loving, rejuvenating, you know, aspects of the hero where you, where you support and, and lift up those around you. I think that's where you're going to get the most, um, 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 you know, bang for your buck, so to speak, you know, the, the, the most, the most gusto. Guys, I'm afraid we need to wrap up. So I'm just going to do a closing round. We can always do this again. For me, it's been fun. And if you guys want to go again for a round two for another 90 minutes and great, but I, I want to end with like, what is the most pragmatic thing? So no intellectual masturbation. What is the most pragmatic? It could be a tool. It could be a realization like a, a thing to hold in mind. Yeah. What is the most pragmatic thing for people right now? I'm going to go with most. So let's see how deep, dig, dig, dig deep with this one. And we'll do uh, John guy, Rafe, and then Mike to finish. <laughs> so what's the most pragmatic thing? Um, find ways of transformation that increase your sense of connection. That's it. Boom. Guy, if you can beat that, I'll give you a hundred dollars. Mm. <laughs> find 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 the place. Find your like train your interest to to tune into the most the most pertinent and relevant thing while understanding you're an ant walking on top of an elephant and bring just bring all of your attention there and all of your gifts there and listen deeply. I'm going to start with the very, very practical. Wear a mask when you're in public. <laughs> Gloves if you're at the store. Um, wash your hands a lot. Um, and beyond that, I would say recognize that crisis is an opportunity to know who really has your back and to know who has real insights to share and to, to break your own epistemological stories your narratives that are not serving you, right? This is, we need to, we need to have compassion. We need to ground the fact that this is a tragedy for many, many people. And we can't lose sight of that. But if we only focus on the tragedy, we lose the potential for post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. And that's the most powerful thing out there. So see how this grows you, see how this grows your community, see how this grows a better world to come out of it. I would have to say, uh, to build on what everybody has said, whether you're, um, training your focus to be on what's relevant, um, whether you're looking for a transformative connection, that all of that, all of that is going to require discipline. So be consistent with your efforts and your focus, be consistent with your attention and, um, you know, trust in, have, ha, you know, have faith in the process of that transformation stay disciplined it, it will come you'll you'll see that it'll come as long as you're disciplined gonna go with daily body practice following on that as the foundation a commitment to truth that goes beyond being liked being disagreeable is something to cultivate and 
well, I was reminded of one the other day. You can't win an argument with your partner if you live with someone. Be fucking nice to them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> gentlemen this was epic i hope we get a chance to do it again i wish you and all your loved ones are safe and well thank you so much for joining us today thank you everybody thank you mark cool. thank you thank you some ways to uh, get more to give back and to get more involved now so um the biggest request i have would be to share the podcast with your friends people that you think would really enjoy it um email it to them put it on your social media tell them about it old school um yeah really appreciate that equally if you want to support us financially you can go to patreon that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode and i'd say they're well worth a dollar so um that's less than a pound if you're in uk ish so yeah please go there um on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted if you're most people i think listen to for itunes um itunes we'd certainly appreciate a review the way itunes works means that a review means more people will find it itunes regards it as more important for searches so even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us and if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com you can see the actual you know links to the sites there's comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy and of course is our newsletter list if you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embody facilitator course and our um you know our next Embody yoga principles teacher training then go to that website and you'll see a little pop-up and you can um get the newsletter through there okay so i think they're the main ones tell your friends pay us some money on patreon give us a review on itunes uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there Oof, bit long uh, pick whatever you like that works for you mm-hmm.